Hello guys, welcome to Alice Update channel. This is a platform where the word of God is richly brought to your space. As you listen to this word, your life will never remain the same. You shall be transformed, you shall be inspired by the Holy Ghost. Every sickness shall be terminated. Thank you for watching. Like and share and subscribe. Hallelujah. I hate and pray. Just talk to the Lord yourself. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we honor you, we worship you, and thank you for another beautiful opportunity to hear the word of God, to be taught by the Holy Spirit. We open our minds and our hearts to receive your word gladly. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Hallelujah. How was your day? Beautiful? Yes, tonight we got to talking about the terminal generation. Is that right? We have discussed the inspiration of the Bible and we got to the ministry of the Son of God and then we went on to the terminal generation to introduce what that is. Today I'm not sure where I will wind up, but um, I will begin with the person of the Holy Spirit, all right? Because we talked about the person of Jesus, even though we didn't go into detail, because I said you should get the tapes. We have several tapes on that already. But I want to begin with the person of the Holy Spirit. From what we said from the inspiration of the Bible, we should by now have quite some information on the fact that the Bible reveals the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is not the least of the three someone said the father is the highest followed by the son and then the Holy Spirit but that's not true the son is co-equal with the father and the Holy Spirit <coughs> is co-equal with the father as well and he is as much an individual person as the father and the son and he's capable of individual existence. The Holy Spirit is as much an individual person as the Father and the Son and is capable of individual existence. Now he is a person. A lot of people think that he is smoke or he is water or he is a cloud 
Some even think he's a dove. Because they say that um, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in the form of a dove. But the Bible also symbolically speaks of the Spirit as light and wind. That doesn't make him wind. Hallelujah. But it's very interesting to know that um, the word translated spirit in the Greek as well as the Hebrew is the same word for wind or breath. But that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is wind. He is a person. Jesus said God is a spirit. Some people say, well, God is spirit. Even in some newer translations, they, they write, God is spirit. No. There's a definite article. He is a spirit. Demons are spirits. Angelic beings are spirits. Man is a spirit. And God, he is the father of spirits, the Bible says. So, he is a spirit. All right, so the Holy Spirit has personality, and that's what we're talking about now. He has a mind. Will you turn to Romans, the eighth chapter? I want to find out what, what is this Holy Spirit. Is he a thing? Is he stone? Is he winged? He has a mind. The reason we can say that the Holy Spirit is a person, number one, I said he has a mind. Verse 27, Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, And he that searcheth the hearts of the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he make an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the mind of the Spirit. So he has a mind. He has a will. First Corinthians chapter 12. The Holy Spirit has a will. He has a will. Hallelujah. A candle doesn't have a will. Wind doesn't have a wheel. What do you think? Oil doesn't have a wheel. The cloud doesn't have a wheel. But the Holy Ghost does have a wheel. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now I'm reading the 11th verse. It says, But all these work at that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So he has a wheel. The Bible says he does this according to his own will. He gives people the gifts of the Spirit according to his own will. He has a will of his own. Praise God. Hallelujah. And then he speaks. He speaks. A dove doesn't speak. He speaks. Book of Acts, 8th chapter. Book of Acts, chapter number 8. And we are reading verse 29. It says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself this chariot. Acts chapter 16. See, he has intelligence. Praise God. Acts chapter 16. And I am reading from verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. The Holy Spirit forbade them to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit permitted them not. Say, he's got intelligence. The Holy Spirit didn't let them. He didn't let them go in that direction. Verse 10, And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, shortly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Praise God. St. John's Gospel, chapter 16. St. John, chapter 16. I'm reading verse 13. Verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. 
For whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. See, he speaks. Praise God. The Holy Spirit speaks. He has a mind. He has a wheel of his own. He has a mind of his own. He has a wheel of his own, and he speaks. He's an individual person. He speaks. He has a mind. He has a wheel. That's got to be a person. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, what does it say? Popular verse of scripture. Turn in there, you'd see it. <clears throat> says, He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Spirit does speak. Hallelujah. All right, verse 10, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians. He sees. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things. You see that? He can search. He searcheth all things, yet the deep things of God. And then, he can be wounded. He can be offended. He can be grieved. That's got to be a person. He can be grieved. You know what it is to be grieved? When your emotions are wounded, that means he's got emotions. He has a mind, he has a will, he speaks, he sees, he has emotions. The Holy Spirit has emotions. He can be wounded. Isaiah chapter 63. Book of Isaiah chapter 63. And I am reading verse 10. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. Vexed. They vexed his spirit. That means they grieved his spirit. The people rebelled and grieved the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the Old Testament. What they did back there in the, the Old Testament as they journeyed to the promised land. They grieved the Holy Ghost. And he fought against them. Praise God. All right. Now you can see that more clearly in Ephesians 4 chapter. Ephesians chapter number 4. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit and we say, the Spirit said to me, you can understand how, how do we come about these things? The Bible does tell us that the Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit has a mind. He sees. He can be grieved. Which means, see, if he can be grieved, he can be happy with you or unhappy with you. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Visions chapter 4. I'm reading verse 30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. It tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. It tells us that those in the Old Testament, when they grieved the Holy Spirit, he fought against them. He worked against them. He fought against them. They couldn't be successful because the Holy Spirit fought against them. He was grieved. And now the Bible tells us not to grieve him. If he tells us not to grieve him, it's proof positive he could be grieved. He can be resisted. He can want to do something in your life and you resist him. He can want to do something in your job and you resist him. He can want to do something in your family and you resist him. It's possible to resist the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes people say, well, God is such a big God. God is so powerful. God is almighty. Nobody can resist God. Well, they're ignorant of the scriptures. Just like Jesus said, through your traditions, you can make the word of God of non effect in your life. The word of God can become ineffective in a man's life. Because of his own adherence to his traditions. Hallelujah. So he can be resisted. Look at the book of Acts 7 chapter. Acts chapter 7. Here Stephen is talking. Talking to the people. 
to the council that was assembled against him. And then he said from verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. He says, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. It's possible to resist the Holy Ghost. Now, you can resist him, which means you can stop him from doing something good in your life. Something that he wants to accomplish in your life. You can resist him. You can stop him from doing it. Of course, if God is taking an action against somebody, no one can stop him. You don't resist him that way because, you see, this time is not for your benefit. It's for the benefit of somebody else. You get it? You can resist him in your own life. You cannot resist the Holy Spirit doing something for me. I cannot resist him doing something for you. But you sure enough can resist him in your own life. In things that concern you. So you have to be careful. You see, this is a person. If he has a mind and he has a will and he speaks and he sees and he can be wounded or grieved and resisted. He's got to be a person. He can be quenched. What do you mean quenched? That doesn't mean laid to rest. It doesn't mean that he, he can be laid to rest. What do you mean quenched? You know someone is zealously affected. Someone is working with you affectionately. You understand? The Holy Spirit is in love with you. You can quench his zeal in your life. See, when we are acting toward God zealously and doing the things of God zealously and happy about the things of God, rejoicing in his presence, worshiping him in his glory, the Holy Spirit likes it. But you can quench it. You can quench all of that in your life. And when you do quench that, you actually quench the spirit. See? Have you ever gotten somebody out of action? Come on here. Are you in this room? Are you still thinking of your lunch? Are you here? Mm -hmm. Or oh, has anybody ever done it to you? You were very happy with somebody, but he just said something that just got you calmed. You, you, just, you, you just got cold. I mean, you were so happy to see him, and he just said something that, oh boy. Shh. You were quenched. <laughs> That's what he's talking about. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm reading verse 19. He says, quench not the spirit. He tells us not to quench the spirit. If you're zealous for the Lord, keep your zeal on. Keep your fire burning. Don't let anybody put it out for you. The coldest folks are the ones that try to put us out. And then they say all manner of stupid things about us and they don't know they're grieving the Holy Ghost by the things they say. And they use such nasty, base, <sighs> insultive I'm trying to think of the... You can even see it on my face already. You know what I'm talking about. Have you ever heard someone say, He is spirit? They're trying to describe someone who's zealous for the Lord. And they use such base terms. They remind me of the vagabond Jews. They remind me of the basest fellows in town, according to the Bible. The sons of Belial. 
when they talked that way. And they called themselves Christians as a snare those who are on fire for the Lord. Such are the sons of Belial. But they're in church. They prophesy when the atmosphere is charged enough. They get hot when there's a revival program in town. Of course, as soon as they get out of the church building, they shake it off. Don't be that way. When they snare at others who are working for the Lord, rebuke them sharply. When you hear people talk like that, rebuke them sharply. Don't ever find yourself in that camp. It's the wrong place to be. They're ignorant of the scriptures and they know not the spirit. They're essential, the Bible says, having not the spirit. Carnally minded. The Bible calls them clouds without water. Let's talk about his divine attributes. The Holy Spirit is number one. Now, we have established that he is a person. Now we want to say that he is God. In other words, he is deity. So watch this. He is number one, omnipresent. He is omnipresent. Only God could be omnipresent. But this Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, is omnipresent. And remember, our scripture, we said, is given by inspiration of God. Don't forget, the word of God, the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Psalm 139, and we are looking at verse number 7. Psalm 139, from verse 7. <clears throat> are you there? Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Let me quickly say something about that hell he's talking about. I want to let you know, the man... is referring to shell and shell means grave all right if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall uphold me if I say surely the darkness shall cover me even the night shall be light about me yea the darkness hideth not from thee but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. <laughs> In other words, this spirit doesn't know the difference between the dark and the light. He walks into the dark as though it's light. Why? He himself is light. <laughs> Hallelujah. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Hallelujah. What is the man saying? What is the man saying? He is saying that God is everywhere. And who is he talking about here? The Father, the Son, or the Spirit? The Spirit. He says, whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? I can't run away from you, he says. So he is omnipresent. Hallelujah. Number two, he is omniscient what do you mean <laughs> didn't you hear me <laughs> what do you call it <laughs> did you hear what they said they said it's omniscient <laughs> omniscient no 
wonder there was an uproar. <laughs> they thought I should say omniscient. <laughs> Omniscient. The quality, the attribute is omniscience. That's the pronunciation. At least give me some credit that I must have checked it out. <laughs> Praise God. All right. So, and that means he's all knowing. He's got all knowledge. First Corinthians chapter 2. And we read from verse 9. But as it is written, I had not seen nor ye heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. But God had revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Hallelujah. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. He knows as God knows. He knows everything about God. <laughs> Hallelujah. He knows everything. Number three, he's omnipotent. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. The power of the highest, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the Holy Ghost is called the power of the highest. Did you see that? Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Can you say amen? amen? Oh, that's beautiful. He is the power of the highest. So he's omnipotent. Number five. Number four, he is eternal. Hey, this is beautiful. He is eternal. In Hebrews the ninth chapter and the fourteenth verse, he's called the eternal spirit. He's called eternal spirit. Hebrews the ninth chapter and the fourteenth verse. You want me to read it? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, put your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So he is eternal. He's called the eternal spirit. Number five. In the book of Acts, the fifth chapter, in the third and fourth verses, you'll find that he is referred to as God. He is referred to as God. Because uh, you remember Ananias and Sapphira? And uh, Peter said to them, Why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? And then, still speaking, by the time you got in the fourth verse, he said, You have not lied to men, but unto God. So if they lied to the Holy Ghost, and he said they lied to God for lying to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost he refers to as God. Verse 6. Did I say verse 6? Number 6. Thank you. Are we number 6 or number 5? 6. He shares the same name with the Father and the Son. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He shares the same name. That's the name of Jesus. So the name that the Holy Spirit answers to is Jesus. His name is not Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is who he is. Like someone calls you a man or calls you a Christian. That's not your name. 
Do you understand? But the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is Jesus. You say, really? Of course. St. Matthew's Gospel, 28th chapter. St. Matthew's Gospel, 28, 28, 28 chapter. I am reading from the 19th verse. Oh, I'd like to read it from the 18th verse. It's beautiful. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name. Not names. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Not in the names, but in the name. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. What is the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? How do we know what that name is? We go to the book of Acts and find out in whose name did they baptize the people. Because Jesus is baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And we found out in the book of Acts, they baptized the people in the name of Jesus. That means, that's the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You cannot cast out devils. By saying, come out in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and the name of Jesus is the name the Bible says that God hath given to him. A name that is above every name. That's got to be the name of God. It's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things and beings in heaven. Of things and beings in earth. And of things and beings under the earth. In all three realms. There's no name as high as the name of Jesus. God couldn't keep any other name for himself. That could be higher than the name of Jesus. Because he says he's given him a name that's above every name. And there's only one name for the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. When you pray to the Father in the name of His Son, Jesus, He hears. When you make a declaration of faith in the name of Jesus, the Father sees to it that it works. The Son sees to it that it works. The Holy Ghost sees to it that it works. The name of Jesus Hallelujah. So he shares that name with the Father and Son. Praise God. Praise God. Now I want you to know who has that name? Jesus. But he does share that name with him. We move to the next one. Where are we now? Where are we? The work of the Holy Spirit. We go to the work of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the person of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about his attributes, that he's deity. And now we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. Now, the Holy Spirit restrains evil. That's number one. He does have the power to restrain evil. He does restrain evil. He does restrain evil. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He does restrain evil. The Holy Spirit. In Genesis, the 20th chapter, I want to read the 20th chapter now. Mm. All right, let's let's go there. Twenty chapter. I want to read from verse six. And God said unto him, God said unto him, unto who, unto who, unto who, unto who, Abimelech. God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffice thee not to touch her. 
He says, I also withheld thee. I withheld thee. Praise God. He does restrain evil. Go to Second Thessalonians. A little difficult scripture there. I want to explain to you. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Have you found it? Yes. All right. From verse seven. Says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall the wicked be revered, whom the, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse 7 again, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now let it will let. Now that's King James. He who let it will let. <laughs> until he be taken out of the way. Now, there are several schools of thought. Many, many theologians got a lot to say about this verse. Some say, well, who is he that let it that will let? Now, what do you mean, he who now let it will let? He who now restrains will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Now we have to put everything in, the, in its right context to be able to understand that verse. People say it is a, a controversial issue. It is not controversial at all if we accept the word as it says and compare spiritual things with spiritual. But if we decide to use our mentality, it will surely be a controversy like anything else in the Bible. So I don't find any problem here at all. It says, he who now let it, we let. He who restrains will do so until he be taken out of the way. Some say that this is the Holy Spirit. Yes and no. Yes, by virtue of his working. But as the person doing it, no. Why? Because he says he shall be taken out of the way and then the wicked man of sin will be revealed. And that's the Antichrist. Now, when the Antichrist comes, the Holy Spirit will still be here. He will still be working. So he's not going to be taken out of the way. So that disqualifies the Holy Spirit from assuming that character in that place because he will not be taken out of the way. Come on, are you still here? There is only one other force that restrains evil on earth and that's the church. And there's only one that does restrain evil that will be taken out of the way and that's the church because the church will be taken away. And when the church is taken away, the wicked man of sin will be revealed. So he's talking about the church. Did you hear me? The Holy Spirit will not be taken out of the way. But the point I want to make from here, why I started this scripture. See, the church can restrain evil by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we do restrain evil. And now, why did I say yes, by virtue of the working of the Holy Spirit, he does restrain evil, he can be referred to here. Tell you why. As long as we are here, he will restrain evil from overrunning the world. But he's not the one to be taken out of the way. We are the ones who will be taken out of the way. Let me show you something from the Bible so you can see who's going to be taken out of the way. It's the same one who's restraining, but through the power of another. Are you ready to see this? Hello? All right. Genesis 19th chapter. You know, every major truth in the Word of God can be traced to Genesis. Do you know that? 
Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 19. And I want to read to you. Do you remember the man named Lot? And Lot found himself in Sodom. We talked about Sodom yesterday. And um, you remember the two friends that came to his house? You remember them? The angels. And they, they said to the man, escape for your life. And they took him out and took out his wife and his two daughters. And so now we are in verse 17. Ready? Chapter 19, Genesis. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth. Who did they bring forth? Lot, Mrs. Lot, and two daughters. When they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. They're talking to Lot. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. See this man, he loves life so much. <laughs> Behold, now this city is near to flee unto. I told you about that yesterday. And it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. He says, just let me go into that city. It's a small city. Don't worry. I, I, so I, I don't want to have danger in the mountain. God said, flee to the mountain. And the man, he believes he's got more sins than God. And he thinks to himself, well, I, I, do you remember the first time when, when Abraham said to him, Lot, now choose. You, you, you want to go this way, then I go this way. Or you want to go this way, then I go the other way. Or, don't let our herds men fight. They shouldn't strive, for we are brethren. And Lot, the Bible tells us, looked for the greener path. And he loved that sight. And he said, all right, I'll take that, I'll take that, 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 that sight. And he went down there to Sodom. And the Bible says the men of Sodom were wicked before the Lord. He didn't know judgment was coming to Sodom. What kind of a guy was this Lot? And yet the Bible says he was a righteous man. See? <laughs> yeah, of course I'm a righteous man. With all these dumb things a man's doing here. <laughs> all right, now God says, run to the mountain. You say, that wasn't God. I'll show you it was God. Watch this. Go to verse 16. And remember that the Lord had been with Abraham. Do you remember the Lord had been with Abraham? And he sent these two men, these two angels actually, to Lot. And then he told Abraham, I am going there. He sent the two ahead of him and told Abraham, I am going there to find out. I am going there. Now come here, read from verse 16. No, 15 will be all right. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot saying arise the angels said arise take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here lest thou be consumed the iniquity of the city and while he lingered the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters the Lord being merciful unto him the Lord now is shown here being merciful unto him and they brought him forth and set him without the city and it came to pass when they had brought them forth they, the angels, had brought that family forth abroad that he said, escape for their life. He didn't say, they said. He says, he said. That came out of the mouth of the Lord who was there present and had mercy on the man. So God's talking here and, and, and Lord. He pretends like he's got more sins than God. God says, flee to the mountain. And the man says, oh Lord, uh, if I get there, there, some evil might overtake me there. Let me flee to this other city over here. It's a little city. I can, I can handle it. Watch. Hmm. 
in verse 20. But behold, now this city is near to flee unto, <laughs> and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall leave. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing. Oh, you see, a lot of times when we tell God what we want, be careful about your prayer because it might just be answered. You know, sometimes people say, if, if God, if God doesn't want it for me, I wouldn't get it. No, that means you don't know the Bible. He says, ask and you shall receive. And in that place, he didn't talk about his will. In another place, see, these are different, these are different rules of different kinds of prayers. Different ball games, with different rules. So there is a prayer that doesn't have nothing to do with God's will. But he says, I'll show you the good and the right way. He'll show you from his word. And if you keep praying about that thing, you're going to get it. But you'll regret it. Balaam came to the Lord and he said, Lord, uh, should I go or should I not go? The Lord said, don't go. And he said, well, the Lord told me not to go. They pressed hard upon him again. He came again. Lord, should I go or should I not? The Lord already said no. What makes you think he's going to change his mind? Why do you want him to change his mind? Because that's what you really want. And you're coming back hoping that he'll change his mind because you think you're wiser. You think he's made a mistake. You think he doesn't see like you. You think he's myopic while you can really see. So you come back and say, I hope he'll change his mind. So you come back and say, Lord, uh, can I really go? Can I really take it? Well, second time the Lord said, don't. Well, he came again and the Lord said, go and take it. Go. <laughs> and he said, thank you. <laughs> and he was gone. But the Bible tells us, the donkey that spoke forbade the madness of the prophet, he almost killed himself. <laughs> See? And here again, here's a man praying to God. Says, God says, flee to the mountain. The Lord who came to save you. Do you think he doesn't know? The Bible says he is able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him. Seeing he ever leave it to make intercession for them. He said, flee to the mountain. In other words, he's prepared for you. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. The Lord. But no, he says, I, I, I want to flee to this city. This is a small city. I can handle this. Please, I, I don't want danger in that place. I, I, I've heard about the mountain and all the... Please. And God said, okay. Why? Because the Bible says, why? He lingered. Time was running out. They even hastened and said, escape for thy life. Don't look back. Watch. Come in here. Are you there? And he said unto him, the Lord said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. I will not overthrow this, this little city you're talking about because of you. Now, haste thee, escape thither, escape there, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Oh, this is what I want you to see. Judgment has come. The Lord has come to destroy Sodom. The man, he, he's, he's lingering. He's wasting the time. And the Lord says, hurry up. Come on, hurry. But he's still uh, uh, trying to pick his things. And then the angels get a hold of him and his wife and his daughters and they flee with them. And then the man says, well, I don't want to go where you said to go. I'd rather go to this city called Zohar. And then the Lord says, all right, you go there, but you're taking so much time. And I cannot do anything until you are gone out. He that let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Until Lot is out of Sodom, judgment cannot come. <laughs> Hallelujah. But yet God's got his time. Somebody said we're having extra time right now. You better know that. We're really in the extra time. And that's true. The clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. Suddenly the message in the church will change. You'll be amazed. Suddenly. The message will change. 
And more than ever, we're going to be talking about the soon coming of the Lord. What are we doing? Getting the people prepared. Here we are, we want to preach on healing. Suddenly, we, we start out talking about healing and talking about the great power of God. Before long, we, we, we just wind up in the message talking about the soon coming Lord. Everywhere. That's a sure sign. We're about to live here. Hallelujah. Tell somebody to get ready. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. So we say the spirit restrains evil. And we can take advantage of that. We can take advantage of that. He restrains evil. If he does, then he can work with us. Because he's come to help us. Hallelujah. Number two, the spirit convicts men. He convicts men. We're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. In salvation. He convicts men. St. John's Gospel, 16th chapter. And I'm reading verse number 8. And when he is come, talking about the Holy Ghost, he will reprove the world of sin. That means he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Amen. Watch what he did over here. Apart from the fact that a lot of people give their hearts to Christ. But there were those who. Book of Acts 24th chapter. I want to read. Something to you here. 24th chapter. Book of Acts. And. Um, from verse 24. And after certain days, when Philip came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. Oh, thank God for the conv convicted power of the Holy Spirit. It works in us as we preach. Felix. Felix. Oh, beautiful. The Bible says Felix trembled. He trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a, a convenient season, I will call for thee. And he also expected bribe from Paul. <laughs> Paul wasn't that broke, you see. Did you notice that in the 26th verse? He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. And Paul pre pretended not to know. Oh, I like this, I like this, I like this. Look at chapter 26. As Paul preached, Felix trembled. He was convicted by the power of the Holy Ghost. 26, I'm reading verse number, mm, where is the best place? All right, I'll read from verse 24. Paul now was here, and uh, Festus, noble Festus was present with Agrippa, the great king Agrippa. And as he thus spake for himself, verse 24, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul! Even Festus shook as Paul preached. Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. <laughs> but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Then he said, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. <laughs> 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 then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. <laughs> Hallelujah. He already saw the man trembling in his boots. 
He knew the man was believing, but he was too proud. Did you almost persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together as I am except these bonds. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I like that. <laughs> and when he had said that, the king rose up. And the governor, and they said, we'll see you again. And that's the way some people are. When the thing is getting real hot, they say, uh, can I ease myself, please? <laughs> Look for a way out. So the Holy Spirit convicts me. And amen. Praise God. And number three. He regenerates. Oh I like it. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee. Ye must be born again. So we get that in St. John's Gospel chapter 3. From verse 3 to verse 7. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, the Bible says, By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's regeneration. All right? In, in Titus chapter number 3, book of Titus, chapter 3, and we read verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. Hallelujah. That's by the baptism of regeneration. Do you understand? It says by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And so that baptized into one body is what he calls washing in Titus 3 5. By the baptism of regeneration. Did you hear that? And renewing of the Holy Ghost. Thank you Lord Jesus. We go to the work of the Holy Spirit in Christian living. The work of the Holy Spirit in Christian living. So you underline that. Number one, he indwells Christians. He does. He lives in us. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. First Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 19, the Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? He lives in you. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm reading verse 16. That he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit. Where? In the inner man. Hallelujah. So he functions in there. And then not only does he indwell the Christian. Number two, he fears them. Now when we say he fears them, I want you to understand the language in which he speaks. Visions chapter 5 verse 18. Verse 18, he says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now when he says filled with the Spirit, he's not just talking about uh, 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 like a, a glass, a vessel that's full. What he is alluding to here is a, a controlling power. He means a man is drunk. He has taken drink to the full. So he's not dealing with the quantity of the drink, but the controlling power of the drink. He's saying, be filled with the Spirit. See, when you see a man that's drunk, what's, oh, he's, he's smelling drink. When he talks, he, he talks out drink. He's smelling drink. He's behaving drunk. All right? Everything about him, then you say he's full of drink. See? But you're not, you're not bothered about how many bottles did he drink. Somebody else may have taken 12 bottles and he, didn't, he wasn't even drunk. He didn't know he did anything. He's still asking for more. But here's this guy with just a shot and uh, he can't see anymore. <laughs> so he's talking about being controlled by the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled 
by the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. All right. So, it's referring to being controlled by the Spirit. That's number two. Number three, He sanctifies. Oh, glory to God. He sanctifies. The Holy Ghost sanctifies. Romans 15, chapter. Now, what are we talking about? We're looking at all these things and seeing from the Bible what the Holy Spirit does. Now, when I see from the Bible what, what He does for me, I can have faith in His actions, in His activity in my life. Do you understand? When I see that I'm not assuming, I can see it in the Word of God. I can see that He does sanctify. I can see it's His responsibility to sanctify. I can see that He fears me according to the Bible. See, this is our faith. The Word of God is our faith. We don't feel His presence in our physical bodies, but the Word of God tells us that He is in us. He says we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So now I know. I didn't know it. I couldn't feel it. I didn't see Him come in. But the word said when I asked him to come, the word said I had him in me. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so I act on the word. So we have to see from the word of God what it says about the Holy Spirit and about us. What is his work? Now, because I have studied from the Bible that the Holy Spirit does convict men, I know I'm not alone. So when I go to preach, I expect him to do his part. It's my job to do the talking. It's his job to do... The convicting. I talk on the outside, he talks on the inside. Amen. Because now I have faith in his work. Because I have seen that the word of God tells me he does this. Now he says he restrains evil. So when I pray, I prevail on the city by the power of the Holy Ghost to restrain evil. Thank God, thank God. So he indwells us. He fears us to the point he controls us. Hallelujah. So he sanctifies as in Romans the 15th chapter. And I want to read the 16th verse. And this is a beautiful portion of the Bible. It says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Every offering that you want to give to God. See, a lot of times when we give our offerings, I say, pray over your offering. Why? Because that's the only way you can give to God something that matters, when the Holy Spirit sanctifies your offering. I told you, what is, was it Sunday we were talking about the Holy Spirit sanctifying uh, the prayer of the priest? Because see, the, the priest is anointed by the Holy Spirit. And because the priest is anointed by the Holy Spirit, his prayer is not ordinary. His prayer is energized by the Holy Ghost. He is anointed. He is called to do this. So God's got to hear him. Because the prayer has been offered by the agency of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Oh, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. When a man is anointed of God, he doesn't need to feel the power of God before God answers his prayer. Did you hear me? Oh, I love Frances Hernandez. She was walking to the... Um, she, she, she wanted to catch a flight and she was in the airport. And as she was hurrying, there's a lady in a wheelchair... She just touched the lady and hurried. She didn't even look back. The lady felt the power of God go through her and she got out of the wheelchair. <laughs> it took several months before she was able to contact Frances Hernandez. She said, you just touched me in the airport and I thought there was something strange about you when you walked by. And I got healed and came out of the wheelchair. And ever since I've been walking, Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? Sure. You don't need to feel anything. If you're called of God, there is an anointing to carry out His work. Every time I face the cameras and I'm ready for the television program, Atmosphere of Miracles, it's beyond human understanding. As I sit there and face the camera, the anointing of God never fails to come on me and suddenly I'm like I'm I'm seeing beyond the words and I can see things that God is doing by the anointing of God I start calling out healings 
not because I want to. There have been times I said to myself, oh my goodness, must I do this every day? Must I? And then I just be healed in the name of Jesus. And the next thing I know, I'm seeing pictures. There's an anointing. Are you hearing me? There is an anointing. Oh, there's more I could tell you. I could tell you. So much more. So much more. So much more. Where am I now? I'll give you one more scripture. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Remember I told you you have to use notebooks. No pieces of papers. Except you have a genuine file for them. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, now I'm reading 13th verse. It says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God had from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. Can you say amen? amen. Number 4, He imparts gifts. Romans chapter 12. He imparts gifts. I'm reading from verse 6, Romans the 12th chapter. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Did you see that? Verse 7, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorted on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. And then, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you can read from verse 1 to verse 11. Chapter 12, 1 Corinthians. But we wouldn't read all of that. Um, mm, I'll just give, read, read for you from verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And the differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Praise God. For to one is given by the Spirit. Did you notice that? The word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, according to his will. Did you notice that? Didn't even have to ask for permission. From God. I said he is himself God. And I finished it to verse 11. I told you I wouldn't read all. We did. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number five. He teaches believers. He teaches believers. Now we said he imparts gifts. Why does he do it? Why does he do it? The manifestation of the Spirit, that's the seventh verse of 1 Corinthians 12 chapter. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every one of us for the common good. So that we can minister to one another. That's the reason for the gifts of the Spirit. Do you understand? Alright, so it's for edifying the church. Amen? Alright, so he's working in the church. So, number five, he teaches believers. He teaches believers. Understand it. See why you cannot be ignorant anymore? You, if there's something you don't understand, talk to him. Tell him about it. He'll teach you. You may not see him, but that's what makes it all wonderful. He's right there, and he'll teach you. He'll explain it to you. Oh. Mm. Mm. <sighs> St. John 14th chapter. We have a teacher in the church. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. 26 verse. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you 
all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Wonderful. I have a teacher in me. Amen. Amen. I have a teacher in me. I am not ignorant. I have a teacher in me. And he teaches me. Praise God. See? First John, first epistle of St. John, chapter 2, from verse 24. We're reading from verse 24 to verse 27, all right? Oh, I like this. I like it. It says, Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he had promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But, oh, hallelujah. He's talking about those who try to seduce us with, 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 with fake doctrines. All the false doctrines of the world. He says, I write this to you concerning them that try to seduce you. He says, but the anointing which ye have received of him abided in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and his truth and his no lie. Even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Praise God. I cannot be deceived. Hallelujah. Because I have the spirit of truth in me. And he teaches me. I have received that anointing. That anointing abides in me. And he teaches me. Praise God. You may try to deceive a Christian for a while. But not altogether. He'll find out. As soon as he listens to the Holy Spirit, he'll find out. Praise God. I like it. Then, of course, you know this. He is our advocate. All of this is in one verse, so I just put it all together for you. He's our advocate, our strengthener, our counselor, our comforter, our guide, and standby. That's St. John's Gospel 14th chapter in the 16th verse. A sevenfold word. Word says, I'll pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. The word comforter from Greek, parakletos. And parakletos means all of the seven words that I just read to you. He's one called to walk alongside. He's one called to go with us. The borrowed word is paraclete. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad about that? This is beautiful. Then we come to what the Word does for us. See, He has revealed to us the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now, what does He do for us? The Word. What does the Word do for us? Let's look at it. I gave you, the, I gave you that scripture in John chapter 14, verse 16. Huh? All right, so you read it for yourself. What the word does for you, you can understand, underline it. Number one, the word of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. Hallelujah. I want you to get this. Let, let's read it from 2 Timothy in chapter 3, 16th verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable it is profitable when you're told something is profitable what does that mean it's to your advantage amen it's for your good hallelujah it makes you better it takes you higher. Can you say amen? amen? So you're the better for it. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, truly or thoroughly, some translations have it thoroughly, some have it truly. Truly furnished unto good works. Hallelujah. 
unto all good works. He's programmed. Programmed unto good works. With the word of God. You're programmed for success. That's what it's saying. Hallelujah. Profitable for doctrine. Profitable for teaching you. For reproof. For correction. It is profitable for correction. Amen. It works. It produces positive result. And for instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. This is beautiful. So you got that. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. Now, number 2. The word of God cleanses. It cleanses. Have you ever felt dead in your life? Everybody was dead until he came to God. Whether or not you felt it doesn't make a difference. But haven't come to Christ. Sometimes some stains come on our bodies. Everybody was dead until he came to God. Maybe you're watching a TV. By the time you're through watching that program, you feel dead. Maybe you're watching a TV. By the time you're through watching that program, you feel dead. Maybe you're watching a TV. By the time you're through watching that program, you feel deeper. Or in some magazine or something or some book or novel. And, uh, you are stained. And some people come around you and they talk dirty. They talk with hatred and malice and resentment. By the time they are through talking about brother so and so or sister so and so, you've had it. You're so heavy now with a lot of negative information. You need a bath. Or when fear comes to you, you need a bath. You need some cleansing lotion. And the word of God works for that. Glory to God. In St. John's Gospel chapter 15, the third verse, Jesus said, you are clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. You are clean through the word. As we study the word of God and listen to the word of God, we are purified. It has purifying power. It works in our spirits. It purifies our spirits. And brother, when it starts working in your spirit, it starts working in your mind. Oh, glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Because it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What renews your mind? The word of God does. That's Romans the 12th chapter in the second verse. The word of God renews your mind. And by the time it renews your mind, it gets to your body. Because it says, let your body be washed with pure water. And what does he mean by pure water? It's not talking about the one coming out of your tap. It's the water of the word of God. And when your body is washed with pure water, you can come out with the skin disease. All the eczema is gone. All the pimples are gone. Brother, all them rashes are gone out of your body. Because your body's been washed with pure water. It's the water of the word of God. Can you say amen? By the time you start speaking the word of God, it goes through your veins. Every fiber of your being, every bone of your body, it's cleansed by the word of God. You're purified. You're made whole. You're cleansed by the word of God. Amen. Amen. So the word of God cleanses. Then the word of God converts the soul. It <laughs> Here you are going this way. And the word of God can change your destiny. Hey. Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. Were you headed for destruction in your life? Where are you going? By looking at your life today, what, where does it look like you're going if you keep going that way? You may be at the edge of the cliff already, but the word of God converts the soul. He makes a change. He makes a turn around. The word of God can do it. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Psalm 19. I love the word. It works in me. 
I'm reading verse 7. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So that's number four. It makes you wise. Amen. And you can get that in the New Testament as well. Second Timothy chapter 3 and uh, verse 15. He wrote to Timothy here and he says, uh, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He says those holy scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. And salvation there is not talking about salvation from sin. He's talking about the totality of salvation. Praise God. That means walking in God, living in God. The scriptures are able to make you wise. Can you say Amen. amen. You know, that's what, that's, what, that's what Adam and Eve should have eaten. They ate the wrong thing. They said they found out. Eve saw that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. It was good for food. It would make one wise. And Adam fell for it. They took that fruit because it was good for food. And it would make one wise. But they took the wrong stuff. But Jesus, the second Adam, came. He said, man shall not leave by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He knew the word will make you wise. And the word is good for food. They came to him and said, master, we've gone to buy you food. Aren't you eaten? He said, I have food to eat that you know not of. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Satan said, turn these stones to bread. Jesus said, no way. Man shall not live by bread alone. In other words, he's saying, pluck, pluck, pluck. Take a bite, take a bite. First Adam wouldn't even wait. <laughs> but not our second Adam. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God forevermore. Amen. Number five, the word of God enlightens you. The word of God enlightens you. Oh, he shows you the way. The word of God brings light. Amen. Amen. Read the 8th verse of the 19th chapter book of Psalm. He says, The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is all talking about the word of God. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Hallelujah. Psalm 119. 119 verse 105. He says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my parts. Amen. Amen. Number six, the word saves. Oh, I like it. The word of God saves. The word of God saves. First Timothy chapter four. The word saves. The word saves. I'm reading the 16th verse. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. What doctrine? The word. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. The word of God saves. If you continue in the word of God, you will save yourself and save those who hear you. Thank God for that. And number seven. The word of God builds you up. The word of God builds you up. Can you see why we go for the word of God? Why we study the word? Why we stay in the word? Why we meditate on the word? Huh? Why you must stick to the word of God? This is the only way you can purify your spirits and strengthen yourself and enlighten yourself, your spirits. Acts chapter 20. Now I'm reading verse 32 Acts chapter 20 verse 32 and now brethren I commend you to God and to the word of his grace to the word of his grace I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up hallelujah which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Among all them which are sanctified. They are sanctified. 
Oh, I thought we were going into. I thought we were going to lead from here into the fact that he's sanctified us from the rest of the world and for us to know that in this generation God is doing a great work already which was supposed to lead us to the prophetic signs that this is the terminal generation but you know I'm out of time I'm sure out of time I'm sure out of time. <laughs> well, let's pray. Thank the Lord by yourself. Hallelujah. Thank him. Thank him for his word. Now you've watched this video. I know you are inspired. I know you are inspired by the Holy Ghost. I know your life has been transformed. Only greatness, only good things shall be recorded in your midst. There shall be no loss in your life, in your family. You shall receive your healing speedily. Thank you for watching.